In today's presentation, we're going to look at how environmental change, which was brought about by the breakup of Gondwana and uh, continental drift, has, has led to a change in the, the type of organisms present in Australia, both uh, flora and fauna. So specifically, we're going to look at identifying changes in the distribution of Australian species as rainforests contracted and sclerophyll communities and grasslands spread, as indicated by the fossil record. And the second part of it will relate to theories of why this happened. So discuss current theories that provide a model to account for these changes. So 135 million years ago, the rise of flowering plants. You may recall from life on Earth that before uh, flowering plants had evolved, um, most environments were, were dominated by the conifers and cicads. Uh, However, it was the rise of flowering plants and their ability to obviously pollinate and seed dispersal and led for a dramatic change in all environments, and specifically uh, the Australian environment. So rainforests began to replace conifers and cicads around this time. Australia at this time was still connected to Antarctica, so it still formed part of Gondwana. Gondwana had not completely broken up. So 45 million years ago, Australia split from Antarctica, and this set up these uninterrupted polar currents. So these circumventing around Antarctica made Antarctica very, very uh, cold, started to chill out. It wasn't getting any of those warm airs coming from the north. Uh, this also led to Australia beginning to dry, and this, this process would occur over many, many, many years. So 38 million years ago, there is some evidence that eucalyptus were, um, eucalypts were found in the fossil record. Uh, however, some of your textbooks might put this uh, date as a little, uh, a little later on in the time period. We also see a rise of hardleaf plants, and this is due mainly to low soil fertility and increased aridity of Australia. So Australia began to dry, and the soil fertility uh, wasn't there. So the organisms that were able to survive had adaptations that allowed them to survive in this uh, in this environment. The evidence for this is we we still see some uh, southern beach the uh, remnants in in uh, Gondwana uh, continents and this is so a re remnant of the tropical past. Now it wasn't that the soils were really always low in uh, fertility. However, in a an environment like a, a rainforest with a high amount of uh, rain, uh, often important nutrients were, were leached out of the soil due to that rain as well. So as uh, the climate dried, the uh, eucalypts uh, evolved to dominate in some respects and um, we, we see a contraction of the rainforest. Evidence for eucalypts is hard-leafed uh, plants evolving from the rainforest uh, comes in the form of one particular um, species. Uh, so this species, um, largely confined uh, to the rainforest, shows adaptations to dry conditions. So we uh, look at the rainforest forest dwelling, the Australian teak. Um, it is uh, closely related to this species, the leopard wood. Okay, we can see some similarities in in their uh, their fruit there. However, one, the one, the, the Australian teak, is more for rainforest environments, and it's a uh, other part of its species is the uh, is the leopard wood and it is mainly uh, found in very very dry climates. So this provides some evidence that the uh, rainforest gave way to eucalypts and in fact the eucalypts did evolve from the rainforests. So Australia's rainforest would have li um, likely have expanded and retreated in line with periods of glaciation. So glaciation increased uh, polar caps, uh, decreased water, so sea levels are rising and also increasing and decreasing periods of rainforest. So evidence of this lies in the fossil uh, pollen e evidence, so uh, found in the Atherton Tablelands. So in the Atherton, Atherton Tablelands, they've taken soil samples and profiles over periods of time, and they found at uh, certain points in time there was uh, increased amounts of uh, pollen from uh, rainforest environments and, and then finally decreased amounts of uh, pollen from rainforest, and this was a cyclical kind of pattern that occurred. In fact, at different points, the rainforest environments have almost been wiped out, only to return when uh, and expand when the, the rainfall uh, again increased for a period of time. At the time of uh, Australia breaking away from Gondwana, it was the original fauna that was, uh, was uh, locked off 
kept away from the, the rest of the, of the world, uh, would have been the monotremes, marsupi marsupials, frogs and snakes, and these were primarily non-venomous snakes at this time. Around 25 million years ago, we, we start to see um, megafauna, basically large animals, uh, turning up in the fossil record. And some of these fo uh, fossil sites of, of significant, such as Riversleigh and Narkoot, uh, show that megafauna are appearing around this time in the fossil record. And they would have existed for um, many, many years and slowly become extinct. Uh, so that, uh, many of them are relatives of the modern, uh, modern extent species of marsupials. Certain things that uh, appear in the fossil record, we can see on the left hand side a, a fossil of uh, the animal there on the right, which was Diprotodon. Diprotodon was a wombat like creature and as uh, big, as a, big as a cow basically. Uh, interesting, it, it is a marsupial and uh, its pouch would have uh, faced backwards like the current wombat. On the left we can see a fossil of a large, large skull reptile, it was Megalana. So Megalana was a massive, massive reptile that also existed and part of the, the megafauna species. So it was clear through the fossil record that reptiles were present in Australia as well. And now we see Thylacaleo, so Thylacaleo or the marsupial lion, so it is a marsupial present in Australia. Uh, it, it is also a carnivorous uh, organism. There would have been a whole raft of carnivorous organisms, including relatives of thylus, thylacine, the Tasmanian tiger, and uh, Tasmanian devils, and all uh, a number of other carnivorous, fitting those niches for carnivorous mammals, however, still marsupials. So as the continent continued to dry, we see the rise of the the dry sclerophyll forest, the predominantly eucalypts, but dry sclerophyll, sclerophyll means hard-leaved. So these hard-leafed hard uh, plants uh, were able to tolerate low moisture and low nutrients in the soil. Uh, with increased prevalence of fire, they developed adaptations such as uh, the fruits being uh, woody fruits, and, and these uh, fruits would have only burst open with, uh, with fire. Uh, so it allowed for, for uh, germination of seeds where there was uh, plentiful sunshine reaching the, the, the forest floor. If they were to break open at other times, they would not get the, the light available to them and therefore wouldn't have germinated as easy. Another adaptation to fire is what they call epicormic buds. We'll look at a picture of epicormic buds in a second. It is important to note that there were, obviously there were fluctuations between wet and dry periods. It wasn't just a, a continual drying. Uh, so there would have been fluctuations in the the flora available at times, so between grass and forest, rainforest and desert. So this would have fluctuated depending on the amount of uh, water over long periods of time. We, we still see to this day these variations in the Australian environment. So when there's big rains inland, uh, the, the rain uh, travels downstream, far, far downstream and fills up places like Lake Eyre and the, the whole environment's come to life over these periods of time and then go back to dry again. So it has this continual renewal pattern. So in periods of increased rainfall, the rainforest was able to expand into the neighbouring eucalypts and they did this by our distribution of their seeds by the wind, birds and other animals and the seeds were able to germinate and, and inhibit the growth of hard leaf plants um, due to the increased shade that the rainforest would have created. So we can see in this uh, in this picture the the woody fruit of a, of a eucalypt. Now these woody fruit, well, obviously it's part of the flowering plant and then they, they dry up and those uh, seeds stay locked away until uh, fire breaks them free, which is a perfect time to increase nutrients from the extra, extra carbon in the soil, plenty of light for the, the seeds to actually germinate. In this picture we can see the epicomic buds coming out of the out of the tree, the, the blackened tree of the the bark, um, and, and on the right we can see the, this epicomic growth, so the, the renewal after uh, fire that occurs. However, the overall trend in Australia, uh, it was drying, became consistently drier, and grasslands developed in the interior, and erosion over millions of years has leached nutrients from the soil. So we see a movement from this uh, wet uh, environment dominated by ferns and, and, and rainforest, uh, rainforest plants uh, to uh, dry sclerophyll with lots of grassland and this is obviously going to alter the amount of uh, the mountain type of fauna.
that can survive. So for modern flora in Australia, uh, landscape is dom dominated by such things as not only the eucalypts but banksias, wattles and sheax, the casuarina family. Uh, one thing to note about these plants that we have our waratahs, banksias and wattles have developed uh, mutualistic relationships with soil bacteria and fungi. So this, uh, this relationship provides more nutrients the plants are able to use a little bit more of the nutrients in the, in the soil. In these pictures, we can see we can see uh, pictures of banksias. On the left-hand side, we've got the, the the magnificent flower of the banksia, which is a kind of a compound flower, if you like, where there are millions and millions of anthers. And on the right-hand side, we can see that the woody fruit of the wattle. And uh, what's distinctive about this is these woody fruits are again would open up only when there is fire. In this picture we can see the characteristic wattle, the yellow colour of a wattle, which is uh, yellow usually uh, pollinated by, uh, by bees. Bees uh, tend to see in the yellow range quite, quite well and would uh, fertilise uh, these plants. And finally in this one we can see the, the New South Wales symbol, which is the, the waratah. And these are, as I said, these are the plants that come to dominate the modern Australian environment. So for at least 30 million years, Australia was dominated by marsupials, and that these mammals filled most niches, and however environmental change had dramatic impacts on them. We can see uh, around 15 million years ago, and again between 30 and 40,000 years ago, there was a arrival of placental mammals. So placental mammals like humans uh, give birth to, uh, to live, fully formed, uh, fully formed uh, young, and uh, so the arrival of these placental mammals would have included mice, rats, uh, bats and ve venomous snakes, including uh, rear fang, fang snakes, which are, have uh, close relatives back in Asia. So evidence of it's evidence for intermittent periods of glaciation where the sea levels were much lower and land bridges have formed. So we can see that this environmental change is in continuing to occur. Later on, with the arrival of the first humans into Australia, we see uh, dingoes appearing about 40,000 years ago. And this would have had a dramatic impact on the type of organisms in Australia. So we can see a microbat on the left hand side, uh, a, native, uh, a native mouse and, and the dingo. About 120 years ago, the first European settlers. So for various reasons, the European settlers brought foxes for for hunting, which uh, became feral, uh, cats for companionship, which again became feral, and we've got sheep, which are grazed here, and um, although aren't outright killing organisms, their effect on um, the landscape with uh, the hard hooves and the type of grasses that they eat has uh, drastically changed uh, Australian uh, Australian flora. And finally, we can see the final picture has got a, a infestation, a rabbit plague, and rabbits have uh, long since uh, taken over many parts of Australia and caused great havoc. These are just a few of some of the organisms that have come since European settlement. So what has led to the change in uh, species in Australia from uh, rainforest to uh, dry sclerophyll uh, forests and grasslands as well as the, the animal species that are associated with it? There are a number of theories that we'll go through just now. The first one, theory one, is climate change. This suggests that as the continent dried, um, ice ages occurred, and uh, also because of the effects of continental drift, Australia moved north, the continent became drier, and uh, change in the environment. Also, it would, uh, would, would state that there was a contraction in rainforests, so less rain, uh, there's return to the atmosphere, so you have transpiration occurring through through the rainforest, drawing up moisture and transpiring into the atmosphere and coming down as rain. Uh, with uh, with less rainforest, as the rainforest contracted, then therefore there is actually less transpiration and less less rain. So a drying continent would have caused um, more fires from lightning strikes and, those, and, and such. So fire, drought all cause this change in the species in Australia. Evidence supporting the role of climate change would be uh, the megafauna and the extinction of the megafauna is thought to have occurred either through uh, 
lack of supply of water, large animals increase water supply, and warm weather selecting against species with large mass. So evidence against climate change, we, we can look at the questions of well, why did the last ice age, ice age have this effect when similar ice ages did not. And we look at climate change today, it doesn't seem to have, appear to have the same effect on large or slow moving species in, uh, in say, South, Afri South Africa and or Africa uh, with their large megafauna. Uh, so the, this is obviously contentious because as the climate continues to dry, we might see extinctions in these species. The second theory is the arrival of humans. The Aborigines arrived around 40,000 years ago, and late as 60, 80,000 years ago, and introduced uh, fire stick farming. So it's the introduction of fire stick farming where they uh, burnt back areas to regenerate grasslands. So the regeneration of grasslands uh, for themselves and for the animals uh, would have uh, would have led to the extinction of some species. And there is some evidence of hunting of megafauna. Uh, the introduction of the dingo would have had a, a, a devastating effect on some of the uh, mammals around at that time as well. Evidence for the arrival of humans is this increased carbon deposits in fossils coincides with the arrival of humans. What this is saying is about 40,000 years ago we can see a massive increase in the amount of fire um, in Australia and this coincides with the arrival of humans. That is one piece. The second bit is that you can see remnant large native animals uh, are quick moving, so are kangaroos. What this suggests is that animals with longer limbs are able to move really, really quickly, were able to uh, survive in an Australian environment with humans present, whereas smaller limbed, large, slow moving organisms were not. This again is a point of contention as there is evidence that uh, Diprotodon, our large wombat animal, was uh, living about 30,000 years ago on the Liverpool Plains, which would have meant that it would coexisted with humans at this time. The evidence against the arrival of humans causing uh, such changes in the species is there's little fossil evidence of kill sites, meaning that uh, there isn't large areas of, of, uh, of fossils that were, were killed because of uh, uh, fire stick farming. Uh, there's also a little evidence of uh, coexistence of megafauna in humans, despite the one that mentioned earlier. It also can be pointed out that there's an overlap between the smallest extinct species and the largest extent, so species still living to this day. What this is saying is that some smaller organisms became extinct and some larger uh, organisms which would be considered megafauna, such as the kangaroo, are still present today. So this suggests some con contradictory information or evidence in this regards. Other theories that exist that uh, account for these changes were include low levels of nutrients in the soil in Australia. So depletion uh, of nutrients in the soil meant that the uptake of nutrients into plant was lower, so plants had low nutrients, and this would affect at all levels of the food chains. Uh, it also would have resulted in smaller animals being able to survive much better than uh, the large megafauna. Current researchers tend to think that uh, the two theories don't have to exist in, in isolation to each other. In fact, that it's Climate change was occurring all the time, and this, uh, this was, so this was the initial changes in the Australian environment, which were then uh, changed dramatically on the arrival of humans with the introduction of fire. So fire was prevalent, however, with the introduction of the Australian, the Australian Aboriginals to Australia and the use of fire, it uh, selected for organisms that uh, were, were fire tolerant in terms of plants, and also selected against uh, animals that were slow moving.